Even so. Amen. Amen. Even so. Amen. Oh, I can just see John as he's writing this down. He's beginning that. Amen. 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 I want this. Even so be it. He is to come. When we have experience God's great love and mercy, we have peace. And that comes from Jesus. It says here, grace to you and peace from Him. From Him is capitalized Jesus who is, who was, and who is to come. We're going to see that several times. That who is and who was and who is to come. What I love is the who is. Jesus in the book of Revelation is alive. Jesus in the book of Revelation. This is what I call the gospel of Revelation. It's all about what Jesus is doing now. For you, for me. Jesus is a present tense Savior. He's not past tense, He's present tense. He was past tense, yes. Song, but it's not showing anything. So let's see what I have to do to get it back up. There it is. There it comes. Maybe I'll get about where I want it when I do this. When the pastor put this together, he put a password in it. It was a password that most Seventh-day Adventists will be easy to remember. It's a password called 1844. Amen. That's the numbers, and that's all it takes. So it's a good password for Seventh-day Adventists. I wish we had the projector working. It's not. But it will be next week. But I thought it would be this week, so I prepared the message with the... Uh, PowerPoint, and after I had done that, I found out that we weren't going to have it. So I'm using the PowerPoint as my notes. I invite you to take your Bibles, open them to Revelation, the first chapter. We will be in Revelation only today. So once you've opened your Bibles, It'll be easy to follow along, and I hope you will do that. If there's some notes you want to take, you'll have to have pen and paper to do so. I don't have any handout today. I will have a handout even though we have a PowerPoint next Sabbath. But it's a, a different message. Shall we pray? Our loving Father, we are so thankful that today we can open your word in your house. As Jesus stood up to, to read, we pray that today as we read your word, you will bless us. Fill us with your spirit. Give us understanding is our prayer in Jesus' name. I started a series of studies on my own not something I needed to prepare for a sermon, but some of it has ended up in that. But uh, this was for my own good. I started studying the book of Revelation, this time with a totally different reason. Not to just understand all the symbolisms and the prophecies that were there, I had one goal and only one goal in mind as I began to study the book of Revelation this time. And that is to see Jesus in the book. You see, in the 1500s when Martin Luther 
was taken captive after his experience at the Diet of Worms and knowing that his life was in danger, one of the rulers had him kidnapped and taken to a castle. And for a little over a year, Dr. Martin spent in that castle. No one knew where he was. It was the best kept secret. The, govern, the, 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 the Roman uh, church was looking for him. They couldn't find him. And while he was hidden away in that castle, he spent his time translating the Bible, the New Testament, into German. And during that time, he also began to do a little commentary on the various books of the New Testament. When he got to the book of Revelation, he said, I don't understand how this book got in the canon. I don't find the Jesus here. It's full of mysterious things in this book. And he didn't understand it. After he got out of that castle and his Bible was published, he finally finished the Old Testament translation as well. And in the process, he totally changed and really made the German language what it is today. Oh, it's doing it again. It's going to go out of I don't know if i got to just keep moving here. The, uh, eight years, seven years later, Martin Luther revisited his commentary and this time he wrote about Revelation that he was wrong but Jesus is not only in it, he's everywhere in it. We're going to look at that starting Revelation 1 verse 1. Now I took what I have on the screen here off of the internet I thought I was getting the New King James Version. But it says the revelation from Jesus Christ. My Bible reads the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I looked in several different translations and in the process I uh, found that the New International Version translates it the revelation of Jesus. The New American Standard translates it the revelation of Jesus. And the Old King James translates it the revelation of Jesus. But I read it in this New King James here, the revelation of Jesus. Well, I know it's in some translations, the revelation from. There's a world of difference in those two. From Jesus or of Jesus. So which is right? So I'm looking up in the Greek and I'm trying to figure out which is right. The revelation of Jesus is the stronger, but both of them can be right. And when we look at the book, we're going to find in the first chapter it's all revelation of Jesus but in the next two chapters it's a revelation from Jesus. He wrote the, he, he dictated to John the letters to the churches. That's a revelation from Jesus to the church. So both are right. The revelation of Jesus and a revelation from Jesus which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw, blessed 
is he who reads. Now we're going to stop right there. I want to talk about this beatitude. Blessed. But before I do that, we are going to look at who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. John wrote all things that he saw and heard. That was what he did. He heard and he saw. And he wrote them accurately. And in there, the number, verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. There are three blessings. And in the days that this was written, blessed is he who reads. Remember when Jesus came to Nazareth? He stood up in the synagogue to read. This was his custom. It was the custom in all the synagogues for someone to stand up to read and then he sat down to teach. Blessed is he who reads because not everybody could afford to have a book of the Bible. They were all handwritten. And they were slow to, and had to be accurate and careful in their handwriting so that they didn't make errors. So very few people had Bibles in their homes. So blessed is he who does the reading, who stands up in the synagogue, who stands up in the church and reads. But then the blessing also is for those that hear. And that was the majority of the people. They came to church to hear. You and I are so blessed. We have so many Bibles available. I have a at one time I had 60 some of them in my house before I started giving some of them away. Different translations, different uh, style, whatever they were. I still have quite a few left. But then I have the Bible on disc and I can listen to it when I go to bed at night. Leone was listening to hers on her, her telephone as she was driving, she said, this morning. So blessed are those who hear the words. You can hear them and you can read them today. And then the third blessing, very important. Those who keep those things which are written. In other words, what does it mean to keep? It means to do. Those that do those things. The chain of communication from God uh, on this uh, on the, the book of Revelation is this. It went from God to Jesus, from Jesus to the to the angel, the angel to John, and in the spirit to you and me, the reader. And in the spirit to you and me the listener. That's the chain of communication. It's a great chain. It's all controlled by God to our understanding and our hearing. Grace. The next verse. Verse 4. Grace to you and peace. Grace. God's great love and mercy and forgiveness. That's grace. God's great love and mercy and forgiveness. And to you and peace. Peace is what comes from grace. When we have experienced God's great love and mercy, we have peace. And that comes from Jesus. It says here, grace to you and peace from Him from Him that's capitalized, Jesus, who is, who was, and who is to come. We're going to see that several times. That who is, and who was, and who is to come. What I love is the who is. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, is alive. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, 
This is what I call the gospel of revelation. It's all about what Jesus is doing now. For you, for me. Jesus is a present tense Savior. He's not past tense, He's present tense. He was past tense, yes. Who is and who was. He died for us, that's past tense. Present tense, He wants us to accept it. He wants us to help, uh, to help us overcome. He wants to forgive us because of His past where He died for us. And who is to come, and we're going to see another prophecy of that here in just a few moments, in a few verses. I call this the Gospel of Revelation. And verse 5 is nothing but the Gospel. It's the Gospel right here in one verse. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and now note this. He washed us from our sins in His own blood. That's the Gospel. Anyone that tells you Jesus is not in the book of Revelation haven't read up through verse 5. Because that's all it's talking about is Jesus in the first five verses and we're not through yet. He washed us from our sins in His own blood and has made us kings and priests to His God. What Jesus is saying here through John, Jesus has made us kings and priests. We have access. We have access to God through Jesus. We are our own priests. We don't need to go through some sinful human priest to reach God. We go directly through Jesus. Amen. But the Bible tells us Jesus is God as well. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. To His God and Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever, and what I love, John adds here, amen. You know, as I read the book of Revelation, I find more and more amens. I find fewer and fewer of them in our church sometimes. Sometimes we're afraid to say amen. But in heaven, there's going to be a lot of amen going on. There's going to be a whole bunch of it. You might as well get used to it. If you're going to be there. Amen. I love it. Verse 7. Now here is another prophecy. It is all about Jesus. Jesus is, we found, is the present tense Savior. But he, He's coming. He's still future as well. Behold, He is coming with clouds. And every eye will see Him. I'm going to stop right there. I believe when God's Word says every eye will see Him, I believe that every blind person will have their sight restored to see Jesus come. Every eye. It doesn't say only some eyes. Every eye will see them. Even they who pierced Him. So there's going to be a special uh, arrangement for them to be there. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And then I love the way John adds here. Even so. Amen. Even so. Amen. Oh, I can just see John as he's writing this down. He's beginning that. Amen. 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 I want this. Even so be. He is to come. And then in verse 8, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord. Who is? We already had that once. Who is? He's present tense. 
Who was and he he was he was the creator of this world. He died on Calvary. He came to live among us and become one of us. And who is to come? We just read about that. And then the Almighty. It's verse eight. The present tense Jesus is here. The present tense Jesus. died for us in the past and he wants us to have a present tense relationship with him today that present tense Jesus will be coming very soon we are living today we are living today on the dawn of eternity Eternity is very, very soon. I pray that each of us will enjoy it. Then, verse 12. Let's jump to verse 12. I turn to see the voice that spoke with me. Fifteen. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget. Yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. It's talking about our, our body. Your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste shall go away from you. Lift up your eyes, look around and see. All these gathered Gather together and come to you as I live, says the Lord. You shall surely clothe yourself with them, them all as an ornament, and bind them on you as a bride does. I love this part. You are inscribed on the palms of my hands, and we will see in, in Revelation 1, he has seven stars in his palm of his hand. And we'll look at that during the message today. Well, it's time for our uh, uh, praise. If you wish to praise, speak up. The Lord's been good to me this week. And I'm here. And my wife and I are both here. And as healthy as can be under the circumstances. So we are praising God for another week. How about you? <coughs> Go ahead.
colleagues, the colleagues here are doing nothing. Well, he has to, he has to get a gun. As the Lord said, Mom, I will not get a gun. And so we need to pray for the Lord to protect the poor. We try to raise cows to generate funds for the poor. People steal them out. We try to raise sheep. They do the same thing. Now they are attacking the chickens. So we need to pray for complete protection around the food. Because it puts the kids now in danger. Because the pastor said he didn't mind if they had taken the kid, the, the chicken, but not hurt the kid. And they did. So um, let's pray for God because he's very, very shook up. And I talked to him. And he already doesn't talk too much. So this, this is really um, shook him up. And I, but I pray God because it could have been worse. Two guys with guns. Big God, even though he got hurt, God still protected him. I saw that on your Facebook and read that. It's really <coughs> um, I want to praise God that he's still protecting all and giving her life and strength. And, um, Laura wants to thank us and she wants to praise God that she's doing a lot better. And uh, we need to remember uh, Shirley in our prayers. She had to go to the hospital this week. She was passing out for some reason. And uh, they had to take her to the hospital. She spent one night in the hospital, and now she's under doctor's care for something to do with her heart or blood pressure or something. And so pray for Shirley. She hasn't started going to church since she left here because the nearest church to her, they haven't started having church back again, apparently, or whatever. So, we praise God that she's, and I pray for Charlene, she's not feeling well today, and we're signing so pray for her. I want to say, you know, the
scripture reading today is found in Revelation 1, verse 1, the very beginning of the book, and it reads the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Shall we pray? A loving Father, as we come to you in this Sabbath morning, we pray that you will bless our church. So many of our members are not here. You know the reasons. We pray that you will give them a very special Sabbath day's blessing. Bless Walter as he's doing a tour of duty and taking care of those that are sick. And we pray that you will bless Randy and his wife and their family as they've added a new child to their, their family. And Lord, for the others, those that do not feel well, that are not here, or are somewhere else this Sabbath, we pray that you will bless them. But Father, we thank you for those that are here. We thank you that we are able to worship you. And we pray for the presence of your Spirit, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we come knowing we are sinners in need of your grace. And we pray for forgiveness of those sins. And Lord, we ask that you will continue to give us the strength and the courage and the ability to overcome those sins. We know by ourselves we cannot do. But we know with you all things are possible. And we ask for that victory. Lord, we pray that you will bless as we continue our worship, that all that we say and do will bring honor and glory to you. As I pray in Christ's name, amen. today is for Texaco Ministries. We have been, as a church, blessed by that, some of that. Uh, we just received a, a nice $500 donation from the conference toward our baptistry, which is sitting back here. We need to, to get the, a couple of items to go with it, which we will do this coming week, and we will have the baptistry set up. And so we, that uh, this is our once a month offering for the uh, Texaco Ministries. Will the deacons come forward? We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to return to you portion of those many things you've given to us. And we pray for a blessing upon each giver and upon this church that it may prosper and grow. Is our prayer in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, I had this on, but it's not showing anything. So let's see what I have to do to get it back up. There it is. There it goes. Maybe it'll get right where I want it when I do this. When the pastor put this together, he put a password in it. There was a password that most Seventh-day Adventists will be easy to remember. It's a password called 1844. Amen. That's the numbers, and that's all it takes. So it's a good password for Seventh-day Adventists. I wish we had the projector working. It's not. But it will be next week. But I thought it would be this week, so... I prepared the message with the uh, PowerPoint, and after I had done that, I found out that we weren't going to have it. So I'm using the PowerPoint as my notes. I invite you to take your Bibles, open them to Revelation, the first chapter. We will be in Revelation only today. So once you've opened your Bibles, it'll be easy to follow along, and I hope you will do that. If there's some notes you want to take, you'll have to have pen and paper to do so. I don't have any handout today. I will have a handout even though we have a PowerPoint next Sabbath. But it's a, a different message. Shall we pray? Our loving Father, we are so thankful that today we can open your word in your house. As Jesus stood up to, to read, we pray that today as we read your word, you will bless us. Fill us with your spirit. Give us understanding is our prayer. In Jesus' name. I started a series of studies on my own. Not something I needed to prepare for a sermon, but some of it has ended up in that. But uh, this was for my own good. I started studying the book of Revelation, this time with a totally different reason. Not to just understand all the symbolisms and the prophecies that were there. I had one goal and only one goal in mind as I began to study the book of Revelation this time. And that is to see Jesus in the book. You see, in the 1500s, when Martin Luther was taken captive after his experience at the Diet of Worms and knowing that his life was in danger, one of the rulers had him kidnapped and taken to a castle. And for a little over a year, Dr. Martin spent in that castle. No one knew where he was. It was the best kept secret. The, govern, the, 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 the Roman uh, church was looking for him. They couldn't find him. And while he was hidden away in that castle, he spent his time translating the Bible, the New Testament, into German. And during that time, he also began to do a little commentary on the various books of the New Testament. When he got to the book of Revelation, he said, I don't understand how this book got in the canon. I don't find Jesus here. It's full of mysterious things in this book. And he didn't understand it. After he got out of that castle, 
and his Bible was published, he finally finished the Old Testament translation as well. And in the process, he totally changed and really made the German language what it is today. Oh, it's doing it again. It's going to go out. I don't want, I got to just keep moving here. The, uh, the eight years, seven years later, Martin Luther revisited his commentary, and this time he wrote about Revelation that he was wrong, but Jesus is not only in it, he's everywhere in it. We're going to look at that, starting Revelation 1, verse 1. Now, I took what I have on the screen here off of the Internet. I thought I was getting the new King James Version. But it says, the revelation from Jesus Christ. My Bible reads, the revelation of Jesus. Jesus Christ. So I looked in several different translations and in the process I uh, found that the New International Version translates it the revelation of Jesus. The New American Standard translates it the revelation of Jesus. And the old King James translates it, the revelation of Jesus. But I read it in this new King James here, the revelation of Jesus. Well, I know it's in some translations, the revelation from. There's a world of difference in those two. From Jesus or of Jesus. So which is right? So I looked it up in the Greek and I'm trying to figure out which is right. The revelation of Jesus is the stronger, but both of them can be right. And when we look at the book, we're going to find in the first chapter, it's all revelation of Jesus. But in the next two chapters, it's a revelation from Jesus. He wrote the, he, he dictated to John the letters to the churches. That's a revelation from Jesus to the church. So both are right. The revelation of Jesus and a revelation from Jesus, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads. Now we're going to stop right there. I want to talk about this beatitude, blessed. But before I do that, we are going to look at who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. John wrote all things that he saw and heard. That was what he did. He heard and he saw. And he wrote them accurately. And in there, the number, verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. There are three blessings. And in the days that this was written, blessed is he who reads. Remember when Jesus came to Nazareth? He stood up in the synagogue to read. This was his custom. It was the custom in all the synagogues for someone to stand up to read and then he sat down to teach. Blessed is he who reads because not everybody could afford to have a book of the Bible. They were all handwritten. And they were slow to, and had to be accurate and careful in their handwriting. 
so that they didn't make errors. So very few people had Bibles in their homes. So blessed is he who does the reading, who stands up in the synagogue, who stands up in the church and reads. But then the blessing also is for those that hear. And that was the majority of the people. They came to church to hear. You and I are so blessed. We have so many Bibles available. I have, at one time I had 60 some of them in my house. Before I started giving some of them away. Different translations, different uh, style, whatever they were. I still have quite a few left. But then I have the Bible on disc and I can listen to it when I go to bed at night. Leone was listening to hers on her, her telephone as she was driving, she said, this morning. So blessed are those who hear the words. You can hear them and you can read them today. And then the third blessing, very important, those who keep those things which are written. In other words, what does it mean to keep? It means to do. Those that do those things. The chain of communication from God uh, on, this, uh, on the, the book of Revelation is this. It went from God to Jesus. From Jesus to the, to the angel. The angel to John. And in the Spirit, to you and me, the reader. And in the Spirit, to you and me, the listener. That's the chain of communication. It's a great chain. It's all controlled by God. To our understanding and our hearing. Grace, the next verse, verse 4. Grace to you and peace. Grace. God's great love and mercy and forgiveness. That's grace. God's great love and mercy and forgiveness. And to you and peace. Peace is what comes from grace. When we have experienced God's great love and mercy, we have peace. And that comes from Jesus. It says here, grace to you and peace from Him. From Him is capitalized. Jesus, who is, who was, and who is to come. We're going to see that several times. That who is, and who was, and who is to come. What I love is the who is. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, is alive. Jesus in the book of Revelation. This is what I call the gospel of Revelation. It's all about what Jesus is doing now. For you, for me. Jesus is a present tense Savior. He's not past tense, He's present tense. He was past tense, yes. Who is and who was. He died for us, that's past tense. Present tense, He wants us to accept it. He wants us to help, uh, to help us overcome. He wants to forgive us because of His past where He died for us. And who is to come, and we're going to see another prophecy of that here in just a few moments, in a few verses. I call this the Gospel of Revelation. And verse 5 is nothing but the Gospel. It's the gospel right here in one verse. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and now note this, washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's the gospel. Anyone that tells you Jesus is not in the book of Revelation. Haven't read up through verse 5. Because that's all it's talking about is Jesus in the first five verses and we're not through yet. 
He washed us from our sins in His own blood and has made us kings and priests to His God. What Jesus is saying here through John, Jesus has made us kings and priests. We have access. We have access to God through Jesus. We are our own priests. We don't need to go through some sinful human priest to reach God. We go directly through Jesus. Amen. But the Bible tells us Jesus is God as well. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. To His God and Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And what I love John adds here. Amen. You know, as I read the book of Revelation, I find more and more amens. I find fewer and fewer of them in our church sometimes. Sometimes we're afraid to say amen. But in heaven there's going to be a lot of amen going on. There's going to be a whole bunch of it. You might as well get used to it if you're going to be there. Amen. I love it. Verse 7. Now here is another prophecy. It is all about Jesus. Jesus is, we found, is the present tense Savior. But he, He's coming. He's still future as well. Behold, He is coming with clouds. And every eye will see Him. I'm going to stop right there. I believe when God's Word says every eye will see Him, I believe that every blind person will have their sight restored to see Jesus come. Every eye. It doesn't say only some eyes. Every eye will see them. Even they who pierced Him. So there's going to be a special uh, arrangement for them to be there. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And then I love the way John adds here. Even so. Amen. Even so. Amen. Oh, I can just see John as he's writing this down. He's beginning that. Amen. 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 I want this. Even so be. He is to come. And then in verse 8, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, that says the Lord. Who is? We already had that once. Who is? He's present tense. Who was? And he, he was. He was the creator of this world. He died on Calvary. He came to live among us and become one of us. And who is to come, we just read about that. And then, the Almighty. It's verse 8. The present tense Jesus is here. The present tense Jesus died for us in the past and he wants us to have a present tense relationship with him today that present tense Jesus will be coming very soon we are living today we are living today on the dawn of eternity eternity is very very soon I pray that each of us will enjoy it. Then, verse 12. Let's jump to verse 12. I turn to see the voice that spoke with me. We're going to see that. John hears and then turns. We're going to see that more than once in the book of Revelation. And it, it's important to see how this works. So here's the first time. I'll mention it when we get there 
in future messages uh, as we get there. This, this will be, we will be looking in the Re book of Revelation off and on for the next year as we, I continue this study. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw, I saw seven golden lampstands. Lampstands don't speak. But the first thing he saw that grabbed his attention was lampstands. Now lampstands, to a good Jew, were nothing new. In the temple, in Solomon's temple, there were ten of them. Golden lampstands with, with, with seven candles on, on each one, or seven lights. That the wicks with lights that needed to be kept alive. And in Solomon's temple, they had ten of them. In the tabernacle in the wilderness, there was one. But he saw seven lampstands in verse 12, and then let's go. There's so much symbolism in Revelation. We're not going to be able to cover all of this symbolism. That's not the point of this study, but there's a lot of it. The lampstands are part of the symbolism, and there were seven of them. Seven is big in Revelation. You can probably add to this list, but these are the, the list of some of the sevens in the book of Revelation. There's seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven plagues. Seven spirits of God, seven stars, and seven lamps. There's still more. There's seven heads, and seven horns, and seven crowns. So seven is everywhere. We will eventually learn that seven means completeness. It's a full circle or cycle or complete is what that is. And there are seven lamps. In the midst of the seven lampstands, as John had turned to look, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. Now there's several things about here. We're going to find in this person and the following ones a description of Jesus. Now, all of this description is symbolic. But now, a garment doesn't seem symbolic, and feet don't seem symbolic, and, 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 and something girded around the, the chest. Uh, is, what do you mean symbolic? Well, if you're going to be consistent in your interpretation, either all of this description in the next few verses as well either have to be symbolic or it has to be literal. You cannot mix them. Then you get total confusion and you begin to un not understand the message. Now even though some things may look literal, they are symbolic even though they probably are literal. And, uh, but we can't go away from the symbolism. Here's why I believe it's all symbolism. One. He had a, he had a, as we read a little later, a sword coming out of his mouth. Now that would have looked rather funny to be literal, wouldn't it? Jesus going around heaven with a sword out of his mouth. What I find in here, along with the fact that the, we have symbolism, but we're not going to get into all the details of it, but uh, of each symbol, is a description that describes that Jesus is still human. You see, he, uh, he had a head, a head, and he had hair. He said it was white white as snow. He had eyes like flame of fire. He had feet like brass. 
He had a chest. He had a mouth. He was a man. He was as bright as the sun. Jesus, present tense Jesus, is still part of the human family. Jesus is still a member of the human race. He's our elder brother. And we read in verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead. We have a living Savior. He's alive. He was dead, but he's alive. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And again, what does John add? Amen. You know, it's been 65 years since John saw Jesus. That, that day that outside Jerusalem, when Jesus started ascending to heaven, and his time on earth was up and he was heading back to heaven. Sixty-five years later, John was having this vision. He knows Jesus. Here he is on, a, on an island, a prison island of hard labor. And he's having this vision of Jesus, the glorified Jesus. Who was up, who was dead and is now alive. And said, Behold, I am alive forevermore. And and that John's going, Amen. Amen. You're alive, Jesus, forevermore. And, and then he says, I have the keys of Hades and of death. The resurrection is our is our hope. It's the promise of what we are looking for. I'm looking to see my mother again. I'm looking to see some other loved ones again. Because of the resurrection, I have hope. I have hope. I look to see my brother. Esther looks to see some brothers and sisters. She's lost. We are, we are living in the hope of that resurrection. But Jesus, there's one mystery. One symbolism, two of them actually, in this story, Jesus does not want us to guess at. He wants to give it to us straight and clear. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, the word angels means messenger. So it probably was meaning the pastors of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. We don't have to guess. We don't have to try and figure out from other texts what that means. We can look in the Bible what that sword that will coming out of mouth means because we know about the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And so we, and we'll find that even repeated in the book of Revelation as we go along. But here we have absolute clarity of what the seven stars and the seven churches are. I want to move to chapter 2. We're only going to look at the first church very briefly and quickly uh, on this, the letter from Jesus to the churches. And it starts in verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Jesus identifies himself as walking among the churches and holding the pastors of the churches in his hand. So Jesus is saying, I am personally and completely involved in my church. In all of them. Jesus is totally involved. Then he said, verse 2, I know your deeds. Your hard work. Your perseverance. 
So far, everything's good. It's great. I know all of this. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That's good. He's complimenting them that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. That's great. But I found them false. And then he says, uh, you get that? There we go. And you have persevered and have patience. They have remained true even when it took extra effort. The church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus was quite a church. We have information in the New Testament. It had a, had a uh, who's who list of pastors. Paul was there. Timothy was there. John the Apostle was the pastor. Mary died there. The mother of Jesus. That's where she died. The church of Ephesus had a great background. You have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Oh, what a great compliment. But then he says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Here's a problem. It's a real problem. The loss of their first love. How big a problem is it? How big? Jesus answers that. Remember, therefore, in verse 5, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Problem is very serious. It could cost eternity. Have that land stand removed. If you go to Ephesus today, there's not a Christian church in Ephesus. All of these churches that are listed here in the first two chapters of Revelation are found in, in Turkey. And this first one was probably one of the biggest and the best. But it says, unless you repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand. That would cost eternity. But he just had said earlier, all the good things they were doing, let's just back up here. And, and look at them again. I know your deeds, verse 2. Your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. All those great attributes of this church most pastors would love to have their church spoken of like this. They did all of this. Then you go down to verse 6. But you have, and God, he gives him one more compliment. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. After all of this, and he says, you've lost your first love. He says, there's still another thing. You do this good. You hate something I hate. They did all the right things for the wrong reason. And I'm here to say that today, we can be guilty of the same. We can be as active in the church. We can do all the right things but doing them for the wrong reason. And what happens? That lampstand is going to be removed. There's only one reason for doing all the right things. And that is our love relationship to Jesus. As he says in John 14, if you love me, 
What do you do? If you love me, keep my command. If you love me. It's all based upon love. And here the church of the first century, at the end of the first century, we're still doing all the right things. But now for the wrong reasons. Oh, let's hope and pray that we are not guilty of the same. That would be so sad. Then Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This letter was to the church of Ephesus. But this letter is also a letter from Jesus to you and to me. It's, the, it's a letter to us as well. He who has an ear. Do you have an ear? Is it tuned to the Spirit? Do you ask the Spirit to give you understanding? Do you ask the Spirit to lead you to take control of your life and yield your will completely to God's will through the Holy Spirit? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then he says, to him who overcomes. And he will say this seven times, once to each church. He, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Overcome, and you're promised eternal life. Overcome, you're promised heaven. Overcome, that lampstand will stay. Jesus is walking among the lampstands. He's walking among the churches today. He's walking in this church today. He knows each one of us and what we are to do. I want to close with a... You back up just another page from the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Just back up one page to Jude. And look at the last two verses. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. I'm reading this from the New International Version. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. To prevent you before his glorious presence without fault. And with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. And amen. Shall we pray? I love you, Father. I pray that you will bless us. May we have such a love relationship that we are never guilty of doing all the right things for the wrong reasons but because we love you, because we have surrendered to you, and because we have given you total control of your spirit in our life, we pray that each one of us will receive that wonderful promise to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And we thank you that Jesus is the one that can keep us from stumbling and falling and without fault. And we thank you is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Do our business. Thank you for viewing our videos. Hope this was for you and yours. 
Um, hopefully please to like and subscribe to our videos and everything we have, every platform we have. Thank you. God bless.